It's the 23rd of March 2019. I'm David Griffin. I'm at Derbyshire County Cricket Club and I'm talking to Mick Glenn and Howard Dyfe. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me as, the, as part of this oral history of cricket in Derbyshire. I know we're going to talk in some detail about the Derbyshire Cricket Board, which both of you have had a, a lengthy involvement. But if I could just start, Nick, by asking you, just give us a brief overview of your cricketing life, if you like, when you first started and who you played for. Well, I started at Denby Cricket Club, the time on a fashion of turning up for, to just watch what's happening and then getting a ball in the nets. Mm. And two days later, you're called up into the second team because the one man short. And, and, and that was it. And it's my 50th year this year. Uh, you, and you're umpiring now, aren't you? I'm umpiring you still now. I still play, play a bit. Odd match. Yeah, right. I'm hoping to play five games this year. Right. And of course, you did have a, a flirtation with county cricket, didn't you? You played some county cricket. Yeah, I played, I played a few games yeah. down here. Yeah. Well, we weren't down here, but yeah. for, for Derbyshire in the 70s. Bit of yeah. competition because you're a quick bowler, but there's a bit of competition about that time, wasn't there? Yeah, there's, there's a lot Alan of really Ward good bowlers and about. Mike Hendrick and one or two. Yeah. Very good ball inside at that at that time. Yeah. You 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 you're being very modest because I know that you the Glenn family are kind of Denby through and through, and I know that uh, many people often talk about you know the the Denby Glenn connection. Without it, I don't think there'd be a cricket club, would there? Well, I'm sure there'd be a cricket <laughs> club, but there's there's been a long fam family history um, on my mother's side previously, yeah. and and my father, and it's you know we've now got grandchildren playing. So yeah, many generations. So there's, there's, we're, we're going to be on the. We'll be on a fourth generation, really? hopefully, in not in not too long. Excellent. Yeah. So Howard, what, what, what you a bit about your cricketing background? Yeah. Cricket so uh, my dad always played. He played. Uh, he was at Burton lad, so he always played. Uh, played for Marsons when the breweries dominated oh, right. local cricket. Then, yeah. so um, I must have watched some cricket. I'm sure. Well, um, Derbyshire played, of course. On yeah, the of course. Bass ground yeah. and the and I Coop, 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 yeah. Coop, yeah. So. Um, Watched quite a bit of cricket, um, must have been throwing a ball around at the side of the pitch and then uh, club-wise I played initially for Barton and Needwood, um, right. I've, I've had a couple of stints there, um, played at Lullington Park and, and now involved at Tignall, um, so you know, I would say I've been involved in many guises at different clubs but all in that sort of Burton and South Derbyshire area really. Batsman or bowler? <coughs> uh, batsman wicket keeper. Oh right. For, for the, uh, the reluctant wicket keeper. I got thrown in that role when I was about 11 because I could catch well and uh, it seemed to stick. It took me most of my career to get rid of it. I always remember asking a wicketkeeper of a uh, recent vintage at Derbyshire, why wicketkeeper? And he said, it stopped me getting bored. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> which I thought was an interesting yeah. Yeah. way in which to, to start your cricketing life. Yeah. Um, now, so obviously both of you had got connections to recreational cricket in the 1990s, which is the time when the Derbyshire Cricket Board was was created. Yeah. So what was the what was the background to the the cricket board creating, and what did what did recreational cricket look like before that? Yeah, I'm um, I'm, I'm sure someone like John Salisbury would know would know these things inside out. As far as I'm aware, uh, the DCB was a direct replacement for the Derbyshire Cricket Association. Um, and I think if you sort of upscale that nationally, there was a National Cricket Association and the Test and County Cricket Board that, that were morphed into one yeah. to form the ECB, the New Wales Cricket Board at the time. I think it was a way of rationalising some things nationally, bringing both the professional and recreational parts of the game together nationally, and then 39 county cricket boards were, were um, initiated yeah. uh, at the start of 1997, as far as I'm, I'm aware. And what, what was did recreation before we get on to the, the the ins and outs of it? Did recreational cricket, from your perspective, make, need to change at that time? Well, I, th I think it just became an opportunity to, to change, and I'm, I, I guess I'm, I wouldn't know this, but I think there's probably some finance to support the right. development officer roles yeah. uh, around that time. So the Derbyshire Cricket Association, the Derbyshire Cricket Board, just became a much more professional and active side of recreational cricket. And there's was the Cricket Association volunteer yeah, yeah, structure. Volunteer yeah. led. So right. it was people from clubs but meeting and yeah, discussing. Yeah, umpires, associates, right. yeah, yeah. so on. It was good people. And yeah. a lot of, I'm not saying a lot of them are still involved. Yeah. But the 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 founders the what they created still goes on, so there's still an umpires association, yeah. there's still coaches, scorers so groundsmen, so there's a, there's a lot of things that are happening. It's it's. I think there's there's a lot more happening now than there was yeah. then. But they had a, 
a representative asso- a cricket association team, that right. sort of thing. Yeah. But the board became a professional yeah. entity with paid yeah. employees. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably an opportune moment to ask you where your uh, role began and your time began with the board. Yeah, you? so um, I actually interviewed for the um, first cricket development officer role. Um, what year was this? Uh, it, was, it would have been the very end of 1996, yep. with a start date of... of Start of 1997, I think. Seems like yesterday, would you? But now you've just said 1996. Yeah. It's um, a generation ago. Yes, isn't it's it? a while ago. And um, Colin Davis was successful in getting that role. Um, absolutely the right decision, I think. You know, looking back on it now, Colin was the first CDO in the new. Who was board. recruiting to that role? And if it was a new organisation. Who managed the recruitment? Was it the old it was, Cricket so, Association? Yeah, I, th- I think they'd, they'd already decided who was going to fill roles um, in terms of the committee. So John yes. Salisbury um, was certainly the first chairman and right. the longest serving chairman of the cricket board. He was involved, people like Roy Pearce, um, Clive Harris, um, Ray Milton, um, who was, he worked for a moment for the sponsor Sapper. Sapper, yeah. Sapper yeah. Yeah. Um, all those guys were involved in that. Um, they were, some of those were probably on the, on the panel. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, Colin was in the post first, and I, within a few months, started doing some bits of work um, for Colin, um, and, and the board sort of grew from there, really. Were you at that time involved with the cricket board, Mick? Y- yes, I was, I was involved, I think, in the coaching and manager of the junior sides, right. and around district, what was we called district group, district cricket programmes. Yeah. Um, or at that time of the changeover, yeah. Um, and then I became well. I've, I've always been involved. I was involved until I think it was two thousand and four when I was applied for a job. And there's some when Howard, you got half a job with the academy or something, or yeah, the role yeah, got yeah, yeah. split. And we went from uh, you went from one and a half to two and a half, didn't you? Staff, yeah, yeah, small yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. So very very small. So going back to that time when you were first appointed. What sort of challenges were there for you looking at the dev- um, you know, d- recreational cricket in a county this size, yeah. a million people, it's yeah. two hours to get from top to bottom, yeah. there it must have been some enormous challenges. The, it probably felt like that at the time, but actually when you look at, at how big the cricket board is now and the scope of its work um, and the depth of its work, it, it seems incredibly simple back then actually. Right. Um, because everybody that the funding that came in was from the um, was from the cricket foundation as it was called then and Terry Bates um, who had been one of the trustees of the NCA I think going back or one of the organizations before that he would um, bring the counties in on a regional basis once a year and you had to kind of justify your spend yeah. right. of, the, of the grant you'd had um, but it was on a, a simple form and every, everybody had the same form so you'd get uh, a max of this much for your CDO, this much for uh, umpires courses, this much for coach ed, and it was small fry compared to yeah. compared to now. Uh, and as I say, incredibly simple. I mean, one of the first things Derbyshire did, which I think has stood the test of time, is make this alluded to it, is the sort of district setup, but not necessarily from a a district cricket playing entity, more to do with the district development groups. Um, and those have stood the test of time, and I think probably one of the greatest legacies of the cricket board. The development groups have, have been a sort of local driving force in, in seven areas. Which have did, did you have a set of national uh, objectives? Was kind of every cricket board given the same sort of objectives and you, you had to go out and meet them? Yeah. And there what, what kind of things were they then? Um, well, they were just, the, the, if I remember correctly, it was, it was almost only a two page thing. It had, it had um, your cricket development officer role, it had something called assessment centres, I think they were called, which, which they obviously did roughly on a district or regional level, there was what coach education you were putting on, what you were putting on for umpires and scorers, uh, there was something very uh, minimal in those days for women and girls, that yeah. wasn't a big priority in those days, um, nationally, um, and then there would have been your pathway. Um, and, and how did that work in conjunction with leagues, because of course uh, in, uh, to, around that time, it was a year or two after, wasn't it, the Premier League was yeah. formed. And no, was, the, I think the, it was 2001. Right, yeah. League so so how, did, how did the two work, I presume the two worked together pretty closely? Yeah, well I, th- I think 
I think that the relationship with the Derbyshire Cricket Board actually was more around the development groups. Right. That was that was a, a, a prime relational engagement with the clubs through that. And so what, what was a development group, I mean? Um, development group run on a district basis. Uh, so, so it links into a district at Amber Valley, Derby City. So the clubs in that district, but other partners as well. So you might get you, you try and get someone from officials, the schools, yeah. the local authorities, uh, groundsmen. Right. It just depends. So it's development it, across the board, not yeah. just a, a player. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it, the whole everything thing yes, to do with the yes. Kids. And and it linked in, I think, in the probably it was the early two thousand. It linked into what was called district cricket mm-hmm. through an active active sports program. Right. Which which was there to support, if you like, the level down from young county players. Yes. So it was that next level below, which is which has been a great success. Yeah. Really. So lots and lots of young cricketers have had a program of um, coaching at, at at a different, a slightly different yeah. level. And what about the expansion? Because you, you you said Howard that when it started, looking back, it was actually on reflection looked quite simple. Yeah. But clearly, the the, the organisation is much bigger now, yeah. and it seems to have broadened its remit. So did that come about uh, incidentally, or, or was it by design? Um, I think a bit of both, really. Uh, naturally, I remember um, perhaps around 2012, something like that, I remember going to seek some advice from uh, a gentleman called David Joy, who was then the director of Derbyshire Sport. Right. Because um, we'd reached a, a size as an organisation where uh, my role was heading it up, I'd sort of not say I'd, I'd run out of ideas, but I, I sort of thought, right, we've, I'm hitting a, a, a ceiling here a little bit in terms of to burst through this, what other um, stakeholders do I need involved, what other resources do we need involved, or do we try and stay at this, this sort of size? And that was when we had something sort of probably 10 to 12 staff, which is, is, is still the same now. Uh, the expectations from ECB had never been bigger. Um, say you're trying to keep your county sports partnership on board and, and use Can them. I just, just ask you there, you say the expectations and them, so what were those em- emerging expectations or were they the same expectations? No, I think, I, think, I think not only the, as I say, not only the, um, the variety and, and, and breadth of what ECB asked people to do, so in terms of your programmes had grown, quite yeah. rightly, but the depth, and when I say the depth, I mean even everything from an administrative perspective, um, some might class it as jumping through hoops at times, but but yeah. that kind of thing there was there was more red tape to go through, but only because of the the vast number of stakeholders nationally. So Sport England demanded that things had to be done yeah. in a certain way. Governance became a big thing. So in two thousand ten, I think it was DCB became an incorporated body. Uh, ECB strongly recommended that every county board became incorporated. That brought another level of yeah. you know, of challenge with it um, and governance. So I think it was, it was. Um, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say the focus went away from traditional cricket development. It just meant you had to you had to really make sure everything was covered yeah. from every angle. Really, I was I was going to say because you've you've touched on some really important new areas, but of course safeguarding and women's cricket became to the fore, didn't yeah. they? In the sort of the last uh, perhaps a decade ago and yeah. onwards, and I know Mick at Denby you got a very strong women's cricket connection so so was was that built into what the cricket board were doing as well as what you were doing at Denby? Yeah it's developed into slightly different levels so I think when I first started there was there was a, a county teams at all the levels but there was little else beneath it there was it was supported by there was a midweek league yeah uh, midweek I suppose it was a t20 league or the equivalent of uh, whereas now there's a, there's, there is a lot more participation, a lot more different opportunities for women and yeah. girls. But the interesting thing about the the expectation that I think you find, and we've often, myself and I have often talked about it, the ECB do put an expectation on, and, and other people do as well. But of course, the club game just keeps doing what it does. Yeah. So you get something. It's very difficult to drop something when you've been used to working with yeah. a club. We'll help you on this. So, oh, no, we can't, and, and life isn't quite as simple as yeah. that. So, th- we do a, an amazing amount of stuff now in cricket, and even at a club, it's no different. It's mm. you know, clubs now seven, eight, nine junior teams, women's section, softball, everything, yeah, events, all sorts of stuff. 
And what about, you touched on the academy, because I know you worked in the academy, yeah. didn't you, with Carl Crick, and so yeah. that came along in 2003, so it was a, quite a busy time, that late 90s, early noughties for recreational cricket, yeah. academy cricket, Premier League set up and everything else. Yeah. So did, did your, was the game crossover work, and how did that crossover work um, yeah, manifest I mean, itself? I, again, I think it was pretty seamless in, in Derbyshire, and I think... Whilst people always say, you know, it shouldn't be about personalities, um, you know, Crick and I have always got on, work well together, and therefore going back, the pathway then was seamless, because um, Carl Crick was the first academy director, yep. I worked as, I think, uh, I think from the title it was academy coach, but I still maintained the role with the DCB as well, and therefore we never really probably sat back to think, are there anything here on the pathway we're missing, because... We weren't missing anything, yeah. um, and, it, and it, it grew. Um, I think the, the Derbyshire Academy, um, from an ECB perspective, an audit perspective, was, was always well recognised. Um, and I think the pathway was well, well recognised, considering the talent pool that Derbyshire has. Um, so I don't, I don't think it was. We didn't change very much. I don't think uh, particularly, other than the facility. Obviously, the first couple yeah. of years were in the old indoor. <clears throat> At old indoor shed, which is a, a challenge in January. Well, Mick will remember that from his oh, youth, yeah. won't you? I, I did, suppose yeah. you used it, obviously, yeah. as yeah. you got old. Yeah. Interesting, I'm interested to know, the academy, um, and we can all debate why players don't kick on yeah. as they yeah. get older, but the yeah. academy, we could probably write down 20 names now, easily, that have come out of the academy and played first-class cricket. Yeah. The last few years, you, you can go through Ben yeah. Slater and Tom Taylor, Will Davis, yeah. Ben Conn. You can go back to Pete McGoin from Danby, yeah. Yeah. to Young Borrington. There, yeah. there are lots and lots and sure. lots of names, Jack Needham. Would they have come through to county cricket without the academy? Would they still have got the the chance to, to play, do you think? Or did the academy enhance their That's a good question. I mean, I don't... Because you came through without yeah. the academy, well, maybe, yeah. with a lot of Derby well, born, Derby Shibble. Well, I'll tell you how it seemed, it might, might be incorrect, it seemed like you had the system and you had, a, I think he's played up to under 19 cricket, uh, it's called Colts at that yeah. stage, and I think generally speaking, if you're the best Colts player, you got 10 on the staff, right. and I'm not I don't know if that was true, it yeah. perhaps wasn't true, uh, but I think you get, I think the academies give people a chance for a better programme I, I, you know I wish that about I wish the programme that the lads have would have been available to me when I was what sort of player. things what, what just a brief overview of what an academy player programme is that I would give you that better but it's a pretty <laughs> intensive programme for, for young cricketers yeah I think it's I think it's the holistic nature of it as well I mean I've Every academy director or academy will do it slightly differently, but depending on the amount of contact time you've got, I think the best way of describing it is looking at those five performance factors of technical, tactical, physical, mental and lifestyle, and you're making sure you're developing the person as well as the cricketer. Um, and that can sound a little bit twee at times, but actually making sure you're trying to develop those players into, into good people, good citizens, um, they've got other skills, whether it be... Um, presentation skills, organisational skills, public speaking, all those things, they get as well. So they get a pretty rounded programme. They get support to make sure their education is kept up to date. Um, and then, as I say, I mean, Crick always used to have an expression about, you know, coaching's on tap. And that was his way. If they came in, they could get in out of school, they could get in early, they'd be, they'd be looked after, people yeah. would coach them. Um, so it, it's a really good question you ask, I think. I think a number of those, of course, they would have made it without something in there, um, especially in a county like Derbyshire, where opportunity has always been great, to be yeah. fair. Um, the question about whether people should or shouldn't have kicked on better sort of post-academy, and I think you and I have discussed this yeah. before in terms of that... It's in your little people's Durham, hands yeah, often, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Yorkshire and Durham classes, they have these uh, sort of scholars, I think they call them, yeah. these young pros on... Yeah. on, on on basic contracts and things, you know, it's, it's an interesting I think point. there's more to discuss on this, so what I'll do is we'll just pause it there and yeah. uh, we'll chat to you again in a minute. For now, thanks, gentlemen.